everyone, welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. I am Thad Forrester and I really appreciate you tuning back in. Uh, this is episode number eight. And before we get started, I do want to read an iTunes review. Uh, even though this is episode eight, the podcast just recently got launched on iTunes and on Google Play. So obviously I'm trying to encourage people to subscribe and to um, give leave honest reviews on the on the podcast. Hopefully they're you know five stars, but you know I want you to be honest. Uh, so our first review is a five star, and this is by Silo Seven. I have no idea who that is, uh, but it says uh, there is a deep need for original content that emphasizes patriotism. So many sacrifices made by so many wonderful patriots. Highly recommend. So thank you very much, Silo Seven. Appreciate that, and uh, hopefully we'll start seeing a lot more reviews. And there could be a few more out there that iTunes just hasn't approved yet. But uh, now uh, I will go ahead and uh, introduce Bart Decker. Uh, Bart is a guy that uh, is the center of a picture. Uh, it's 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 uh, called Horse Soldiers, really, is the, and he is kind of the center of that, where he's in Afghanistan on horseback, and, and his teammates are as well. And uh, he's an Air Force combat controller. He's retired now. And he's one of the original guys who went over to Afghanistan after 9-11. So shortly thereafter, they got ready and went, and um, they ended up teaming up with the Northern Alliance and uh, getting on horseback because where they were headed to, you really just couldn't you couldn't get there by by a uh, ATV or a motorcycle, and so they had to learn how to ride horses. And the the saddles were made out of wood, so very uncomfortable. Uh, it's just, a, I think it's an incredible story. There are books out there about it. So uh, I'll put some links in the show notes and you can go f- learn more about these guys and about their mission and just about the horse soldiers in general because there's also a large monument in New York, um, very, very close to, to uh, the World Trade Center. I think World Trade Center 1 and that, that um, honors the horse soldiers. So you've got some CCTs and you've got some S- Army SF guys and some other guys too, I guess, uh, that were uh, part of that team that went in there originally. So it's an honor to have um, Master Sergeant Bart Decker. So I'll uh, int- bring him in now. Bart Decker, it's great to have you with me. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I have uh, wanted to speak with you for quite a while now. So thanks for responding to my my message to you. No, that's not a problem. Uh, I I, uh, I told the audience that you were one of the horse soldiers and uh, we do you mind just explaining what that was and how you got you know pulled into that role and maybe what it consisted of you can go as deep as you want uh, yeah okay so I guess the best way to do is uh, uh, go about it is go in chronological order and uh, <clears throat> so when uh, obviously uh, after 9-11 um, we, we, we all kind of knew uh, what was going to happen uh, from a military perspective. Uh, so um, I think immediately we began mobilizing. I mean, um, in, in our job and as a combat controller, I mean, our our, uh, our gear, our kit is always uh, always packed. Uh, usually, you know, each member usually has a cage at their unit, and uh, that's where all their gear is kept, and uh, it's usually always ready to go. So on. Uh, on the personal side, that that's never an issue. Um, but then, you know, all, all the uh, all the other equipment uh, that needs to be mobilized, uh, you know, to support uh, to support a unit, uh, definitely needs to be uh, packed up. So, so that was done, obviously, uh, uh, in the following weeks after uh, after 9/11. And uh, I, I, it's, sometimes the dates uh, elude me, but we we were definitely in. Uh, we deployed to uh, Karshi Khanabad, what, what's known as K2, um, in Uzbekistan in early October. And uh, our primary mission, once we got into there, was to uh, equip the airfield with a uh, what was called a uh, MMLS, a mobile microwave landing system. And uh, that was relatively new to our unit at that time, but we had uh, quite a few guys trained on it. And what that did was... Uh, in uh, IFR condition, uh, which is below visual flight rules when the weather gets really bad, allows uh, airplanes to come on in and land. Um, 
it, like I said, mobile system because uh, at K2 it was old uh, Soviet era. Um, it was a Soviet, old Soviet airfield in the uh, air traffic control tower. Uh, you could tell was, uh, I mean, it, it, you couldn't tell when we were up there. It was old Soviet era radios from probably the uh, the 60s, the early 70s. And uh, the airfield had lighting, but that was that was really about it. We used our uh, MMLS uh, for precision precision approaches uh, when the weather got uh, below minimums. And uh, we just kept working C-17 after C-17 in there and uh, and, and built that place up uh, uh, pretty quick. And um, about the middle of October is when um, they started, or we started, uh, all the soft units started inserting into Afghanistan. And uh, so the ODAs were going in, Operational Detachment, Alpha, uh, is how uh, Special Forces are uh, described. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we were uh, attaching our guys uh, with, with those units as, as they went in. And uh, so the, the first unit went in in the middle of October, uh, and then a couple other units would, would go in shortly after that. Myself personally and another controller went in with a team on uh, 2 November. And it just so happened, like the, the, the units that went in before us, they were not on horseback, but the, the guys that went in, uh, in were going into the northern area. Our, our objective was uh, Mazari Sharif in Afghanistan. Why other guys were working in the Kabul area, other guys were working in the Bagram area. And it just so happened the guys working, going to the Masri Sharif area, joined up with the Northern Alliance. And that happened to <laughs> entail riding horseback. So it was just kind of luck of the draw, if you will. And uh, our, our DO, our Director of Operations uh, for our unit, the, the 23rd Special Tactics Squadron, uh, was the one who was appointing which guys would go with what team. And uh, he was kind of the uh, the orchestrator of it all, the mastermind of it all. So I just kind of I drew that that slot with uh, you know with the horseback uh, mission. <clears throat> How big was your team? Yeah. So when we went in, our, our, yeah, our team was a uh, they they. Our team was kind of made up of a, it wasn't a, a direct ODA, the team that I was on. It was, they called it an ODC, Operational Detachment Control. And uh, they, they had that um, configuration back in Vietnam, and it hadn't been used since then. So my team comprised of a lieutenant colonel, a major, a sergeant major, uh, two, uh, two E7s and an E6, and then myself and uh, another controller. So there was, there was eight of us on that team uh, when when we went in. Okay, I didn't realize there was another controller there with you on that team. Yeah, that's correct. And then also in that same area of operation, there were, there were two other ODAs that were really on our flanks, and they each had controllers on those teams as well. And like I said, our and we would meet every now and then, every couple of days, uh, as we moved north um, to our objective, uh, Masri Sharif. And we 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 inserted into a uh, into a valley. Uh, we went in by helicopter, and then from the helicopter, we were on horseback from that point on for about about ten days. Cause I think we finally got into Masri Sharif. Uh, or about November 12th, right in that time frame. So, what was the learning curve like with uh, you know with the horses? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't as glamorous as it looks. I can tell you that. Um, now, when we it was not only on horseback, but there was a lot of donkeys. So, what what we had was uh, we had basically our our uh, our day pack on. And and then of course our weapon, ammunition, our vest, with everything on it. So all that right there weighs about sixty, seventy pounds. And then our our big rucks we had on donkeys, which they the uh, Northern Alliance walk. So obviously we had all our 
all our comp sec and, and all our, uh, you know, high value items on our, on our person at all time. But like our, our clothes and, you know, some food, tents, you know, that those type of supplies were, uh, were all on donkey, uh, because you just couldn't carry all that on, on horseback. And, uh, that would get walked and that would usually catch up with us, uh, later that evening or the next day, depending on how long we stayed, uh, stayed at one site. So, but the learning curve was, was very, uh, very, very high because not only were you that heavy sitting on that horse, but the horses all had wooden saddles and they weren't very tight. So it was, oh, you were always sliding around and, um, it, it just, uh, it, it just wasn't very comfortable. It's not like riding in a vehicle, uh, for sure. And, uh, we moved both day and night depending on, on which day we were moving and, the reason why horseback was was the ideal choice to move is because of the mountainous terrain we were moving through most of the time, and the ledges we were walking on were only probably about two to three feet wide. I mean, you couldn't even you couldn't ride a motorcycle or an ATV through there. It was it just was not permissible for a, a motorized vehicle. So, well, horseback was the way to go, and and well worked out, uh, you know, for us. So did the the people at was it called Masri Sharif? Did they did they know you were coming? Oh, well, I think they had a pretty good idea um, that we were coming. Although, you know, the Taliban held that city, you know, until we got there. Obviously, the Taliban held all, all of Afghanistan uh, ruled. Uh, so, but you know, well, let me back up a little bit too. You, you had asked. Uh, too early in a question about living conditions and no it, it, it is so remote where we were all the way up into uh in the Masri Sharif uh it was it was just mud hut villages that you would pass by um so our, our first few nights we actually lived in caves in the side of this uh side of the mountain and for the first couple nights and then we just slept in uh basically in, in ditches and then there, there was a lot of old outposts from the Soviet, you know, the fight from the Mujahideen fighting the Soviets that were still there. So there, the place was still heavily mined all over. So that was another reason going with the Northern Alliance was, was, uh, was the right thing to do because they knew that they knew the territory like the back of their hand. They knew where all the minefields were. So that kept us pretty safe, uh, in that respect, um, as we moved, moved forward um, up, up, to, up to Masri Sharif. Um, and I, and on our way, we, my, my, my group, we only encountered, we only encountered uh, a rocket fire on the last day, actually, prior to going into, uh, Masri Sharif and, uh, another controller from, uh, from the, one of the other ODAs were, uh, was working some, uh, fighters while that was all going on as we were coming up to this, OP observation point. And then, um, I joined him in that respect and, uh, and worked some, uh, worked some fighters as well that evening. And then the next day is, uh, like I said, I think it was about 10 days total on horseback. Uh, we went into Masri Sharif at that time. And as we went into Masri Sharif, the people started lining the streets because well, let me back up. That that evening, we were on top of a mountain after uh, after working a lot of fighters, and you could see all these cars leaving Masri Sharif uh, by headlights. And what it, what had happened to be was all the Taliban were exiting the city. So um, so actually, Masri Sharif became liberated that that day, that evening, and then the next day we went into town, and uh, the people were all lining the streets clapping, cheering, um, that, uh, that the city was liberated at that time. Wow. So, I'm. Um, did you say, did you encounter, did you have any firefights or have to drop any ordinance before you got there? Yeah, just that, just that day. And, and like I said, keep in mind, there was another controller, uh, with one of the ODAs, um, that's mentioned in the horse soldier book. Um, and, uh, he, he worked, a, he worked a lot of, uh, 
a lot of a lot of CAS missions, close air support missions, as as we moved up. And like I said, he they were on one flank, and then we had another ODA on the other flank, uh, which I don't think that the controller with that other ODA worked uh, worked any CAS as as we went up to Masri Sharif. Just uh, just one of them with um, I think it was five nine five was the ODA okay. uh, number. So you would, I read an interview where you talked about the terrain and, um, but I mean, it sounds like y'all moved at night too. Was that a regular or just occasionally did you, did you uh, move? We, it, it was both. It was a little of both. We moved uh, a couple nights and then uh, we, we moved by day as well. Um, then, then we would sit at an OP uh, for, it, it, there was no set pattern. Um, it, it just uh, was all out of circumstances on whether we moved that night or day, but we did uh, we did move at uh, both. So how did you, when your medic, is this when the medic broke his back was before you got there to? Yeah, that, so that, that, uh, that, that, that is, that was not true. Uh, that was, that's a fabricated story. Okay. Uh, I think he's been admonished for that. And, uh, that, that, uh, definitely was not true. Well, good. Glad you, glad you cleared that up. So, um, yeah. So, so what happened once you got there and the people were cheering for you and they were liberated? I mean, what, what did you do next? Well, we went to, uh, uh so our, the group, uh, that, that we were with was, uh, led by, uh, the Northern Alliance group was led by, uh, General Dosum. So we went, uh, to Kuala Jangi, the fort and the, um, the, might have heard of, uh, became famous uh, during that war of the uprising. And um, so we went to that fort, and we ended up staying there. And that was Dostum's old fort. And we ended up staying there for oh, about about two weeks. Um, and then we, so after uh, we were there for about two weeks, and uh, then we were bringing in, uh, you know, more people, more uh, more supplies, and then, um, as we, while we were there, um, the SF team, uh, you know, more leadership came in from, uh, from the special forces and we ended up setting up a, uh, a, uh, a top to tactical operations center. And, uh, we ended up doing that at a, uh, what used to be, it was an old abandoned, uh, all girls school. And, um, so, uh, we moved from the fort to that schoolhouse. And uh, that's where we ended up. It was a hardened building. The fort was just a big, uh, you know, a big mud hut. So, but once we moved to the uh, the school, that was a, uh, a three-story uh, hardened uh, building. And uh, the, uh, we ended up hiring a lot of the locals and uh, got a lot of stuff fixed there and got it all operational again. And then um, at that point, we uh, obviously transferred transition over to vehicles we had a couple uh vehicles brought in um brand new vehicles brought in by helicopter and then we we bought a lot of vehicles off the uh off the local economy there uh the old standard toyota high luxes and stuff that you, uh, that you see in all the pictures uh-huh. so so then we started uh you know uh we're gonna do our uh daily operations uh which would be uh running the airfield you know, which is uh, one of our primary missions as a uh, as a controller. Um, but you know, after after we were in that school, um, I, I can give you the, the the rundown story here of how the uh, how we got all the prisoners. So when we're when we we're at the schoolhouse, we were uh, we were Dostum um, was asked to go negotiate a uh, a prisoner surrender over in a uh, over in another town and uh and so at that point we were about ready to leave and uh it was myself and, and another group of guys and then we we uh obviously a lot of the people that came in downrange later after we got into Masri sharif stayed back and um as we were leaving the town down comes the road down the down the road comes a uh about you know four to five hundred taliban saying they wanted to surrender and uh so what happened was those let them through and they took them over to the to the fort that we were at you know those prior two weeks before we moved to the schoolhouse 
and uh, within that group was uh, Johnny Walker, Lynn, and um, so we ended up leaving, going to Condos, and that's when they had the prisoner uprising about two days later after we had left, and um, that's when um, some of the other government agency guys got killed, uh, or one of them got killed uh, there, and then... um, they had the big uprising there, and we were in Condus, and uh, so how it all worked was the AC-130 gunships had just got into got into country right at that same time frame, and uh, so the gunships were used at the fort to uh, disclose the uprising, and uh, also I worked the gunships at Condus, which uh, facilitated another huge surrender. Of uh, uh, we had probably over a thousand that were in condos that surrendered, and to tie us all together, of recent events that just happened uh, here in the U.S. Uh, last year, one of those guys that were that thousand that surrendered was uh, Mohammed Fazil, which happened to be one of the five high-value target Taliban that got released from Gitmo in the prisoner exchange. Uh, for bird doll uh, exchange hmm. last year. So, yeah, you can see how it all tied together. Yeah. What did you think? Uh, did I mean, what went through your head when you found out that that we released him among amongst anyone, but specifically him for bird doll? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't understand. Um, I, I just don't understand why why that would happen. I mean, this, this guy was a. Uh, he was a high-ranking Taliban official. Uh, as a matter of fact, before, while we were there at Condus on the side of the hill, he came up to the hillside, sat down with, with Dostum and a couple of other Northern Alliance generals, tried to facilitate uh, uh, some some type of negotiation. Then he, he went back with his people back down into Condus, and the way it all worked out was, or as found out later in hindsight, was the AC-130s did not come on station that night. They were going to attack us and probably would have overrun us because we were definitely outnumbered. But it just so happened, luckily, the AC-130s were on station, and uh, we, we, we utilized, you know, those aircraft. And after that, that facilitated their surrender the next day. So... Uh, so it just happened to work out, but yeah, like I said, he he was he was a very very high ranking uh, official, and I, I just don't understand the uh, the trade because the other four guys with him, they they wouldn't have been in Gitmo uh, if, if they weren't because what happened was all those guys that that surrendered ended up going to uh, another uh, another town, and then they were they were all uh, vetted and interrogated, right by uh, by our personnel of the government agency personnel. And we took the hardened ones, you know, the high value targets, and they ended up going to Gitmo because they they had the most they could do the most damage, right? As, mm-hmm. as the leaders and uh of uh you know, of the Taliban in this case at th- at that time. And uh so there was a reason why they were in Gitmo. And there was a reason why they should stay there. And uh uh like I said, um very very discouraging. And uh, I'm sure they're I'm sure they're back in the fight right now. Yeah, um, no question about it. And and you said uh, in in with that that group that surrendered was uh, Johnny Walker Lind. When did y'all find out there was an American in that group? Yeah, I think um, well, <clears throat> while we were over at Condus, there was a couple other other government agency guys at the compound or at the Qualachangi at the fort. Uh, interrogating the guys and that's that's how they ran across him he was in that group of that four to five six hundred guys that initially came down the road as we were leaving town and uh so he ended up uh being kept over with us at the uh at the op center at that school when we returned from condus he was there already and uh so he was with us for a few days and then we we put him on a 130 and uh, he, he ended up obviously coming back to the states, so we got him out of there. Well, you may not want to answer this, but I'm just curious: 
how what are you thinking you know how do you control yourself maybe or control your rage when you see an american that's over there that that's you know turned against us yeah i i uh, i personally just stayed away from him um uh, you know i i let the uh the s f team guys uh handle him so um i didn't really uh obviously it uh <laughs> it it curdles your blood but uh you know, I just went about my business. We had an airfield to run in other operations. So uh, so I, I let SF do, or I didn't let, but SF did their job and, uh, and handled him. And uh, the only time I saw him again really was when we put him on the, uh, on the 130 because we were working the airfield there and, and got him out of there. Okay. Well, it sounds like uh, there was, you know, large numbers surrendering very early on in the war is that right and and i guess really what what uh calls yeah to do that? yeah you, absolutely i mean um if if you look back at it it it, it was set up uh you know the secretary rumsfeld and and uh, all the commanders and and obviously I, i'm gonna give a uh you know a, a, a give kudos to uh another book um it was called uh, First There by Gary Sharon. And uh, he was with the uh, with the CIA, and they're, they're the ones who, you know, really set it all up at the beginning uh, because, you know, 9-11 happened, and then you, you got to react quick, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it was really set up brilliantly, if you think about it. I mean, we, we were just executioners. I mean, not executioners. We, we executed the plan um, that, that that was set up. Um, but but the plan was was brilliant that our, that our leadership set up at that time, and uh, yeah, I think I think I think Afghanistan was liberated like in 49 days, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on, on the number. And uh, so yeah, you would have you would have large droves of people surrendering or fleeing, you know, Taliban uh, in in that short amount of time, and that's that's exactly what happened. Wow. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Uh, we the, the, when you brought in uh, when there was the uprising was that when Johnny Michael Spann was killed also? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Okay, yeah. he he was he's actually from about twenty minutes from my hometown, and I think okay. he was he the first American killed. Is, is that right? Uh, I do. Yeah, I do believe so. That's, okay, that's correct. And uh, yeah, it's um, bad because I sat next to him in a van. And uh, we were there in November, so we were there on Veterans Day. And uh, we were already up in Masri Sharif. Most of them had us all over to a house where he was at and gave us, you know, a veteran's, you know, he was a Marine veteran. Uh, and, you know, had a, a celebration, if you will, you know, for us uh, as, uh, as veterans uh, on that day. So um, I, I got to meet him. For uh, you know a brief a brief period, you know, it was, uh, obviously a, a great tragic loss, just like just like all the lives have been uh, since then. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's sad. I, I've seen his his daughter on on the news before, and she was very very well spoken and just very well put together. I think she was, you know, she was in college, and you know, she's seemed to have done well for herself. She's probably out of college now. I'm not sure, but. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. What What else about? <laughs> I was just so interested in this this whole deployment of yours. How long were you in country? So, really, you know, this, this was a great thing about being in special operations. Uh, we were only there for from beginning to end on my first deployment. There, I was only there for four months. So, we we ended up. Uh, pretty much all the excitement that I, that I told you was was, at, was over, and you know we we just worked the uh, the airfield there for oh I don't know probably the next two months because I remember I think I went home home I think we, I think we left Afghanistan around the 13th or 14th of January and uh, me personally and 
went back to K2, and then I think uh, me and some other guys left K2. We, we were just going out in, you know, twos, threes, fours. You know, we weren't leaving at the end because we were getting backfilled, too, by uh, by other, other you know, guys from other units. And um, I think I want to say we left around January 18th, 20th time frame where I went home and then uh, then went back on another deployment in May from May to September, another four-month deployment. Because at that time, then, they started setting up rotations between our uh, uh, the squadrons. So. so had you had many deployments prior to this one in, in 2001? Well, real world, you mean? <laughs> well, I don't know. Or, I guess, I guess, I mean, just the, I guess yeah, you were I mean, going all over. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I traveled all over the place for 20 years, you know. Okay. Um, I, I would say uh, the only other, I mean, real world, you know, back in the uh, – you might be too young to remember, but back in the uh, in the eighties, we had a uh, Sandinista Contra uh, war was going on down in Central America. So I deployed down there for a month to support that. You know, it did it didn't no action or anything like that, but it was uh, a real world deployment, if you will. And then uh, just as my career went, um, I uh, was kind of always in the wrong place at the wrong time as far as uh, when the real world stuff came up because. Uh, I was on the uh, I was on the Pope team for uh, for five years, from um, from eighty uh, eighty four to eighty nine, and other than what I just told you about uh, Central Central America, really nothing really was happening. So I went became a combat and control school instructor in eighty nine, and uh, about six months after that is when the uh, Panama invasion happened, and the, the two one STS at the time was the team that went and then um and then desert storm kicked off and i was still an instructor so i didn't go on that which i guess i, I didn't miss anything really on that from what i understand uh and then um then i went up to uh, alaska for four years and uh nothing really there just training and then came down to hurlbert in 96 at the 2-3 sts and uh and then obviously i was there through uh 9-11 and retired in 03. So, so obviously that was my, my biggest deployment, but you know, we, we went on, a, you know, we did a lot of stuff, uh, you know, throughout the years, um, whether, you know, not obviously not combat engagements or anything, but, uh, obviously nine 11 was, uh, yeah, you know, the biggest deployment of my life and, uh, one you'll never forget. So, I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. Is I didn't I didn't realize how long you'd been in. Um, so I didn't I didn't know you were yeah you were in in the 80s and and part of Desert Storm. Desert Storm is really when I was um, I was a teenager and that's when I really was paying attention a little more to what was going on and and I had just you know tons of you know American pride about it with you know with George, uh, with Norman Schwarzkopf and you know I just yeah Storm and Norman yeah absolutely. I mean, just we were just kicking butt over there, or at least you know I thought we were, and you thought we were. I thought we yeah. were unstoppable at that time. Well, you know, and that's when um, that's when the the, the U.S. Uh, perception of the military, as I saw, it, changed uh, to to all all positive. Um, you know, when you look back, and you know, I came in in the '80s, so I had a lot of Vietnam guys that really I learned from, you know, and I was under, they were senior NCOs and I, I was the, uh, you know, the young guy. So they, they were my mentors, you know, at that time. And, you know, and they, and they talked, uh, you know, they always talked about their, you know, you listen to their stories and, and hear their talk and, you know, and then just, just traveling around the country back in the eighties, you know, and, and how you were treated at, you know, the military and, and, and stuff. But then after the desert storm, uh, I could I, I could see the perception in the feel of uh, of the U.S. really really back in the military, uh, and uh, and the perception I, I think changed at that point for, for the good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I've never had anybody you know compare them for, from the from the '80s and prior to uh, Desert Storm, but it, it definitely makes sense to me. Yeah. 
Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, while you were deployed there in Afghanistan, is that I think y'all had something called the Angel of Death. You want to elaborate what that is? What that was? Yeah, if you, if you go back uh, when I when I was t- telling you working on some AC-130 gunships in, in Condus, um, I, I had three three gunships, and they were they were, one would come on station, one would leave, another one would come on station, and they would leave. And uh, one of them that came on station uh, had the female on the radio, and um, it, it was where we were. Uh, up on a ridge line, you know, it, it's it's dark and it's quiet, and uh, and so Dostum, uh, General Dostum, was standing, you know, behind me, and he could hear her voice through the headset, the handset rather, uh, of the radio. When as I was talking uh, to the airplane, uh, actually I was talking to her, and uh, so he, uh, I, I don't know, I don't think he coined it, but um, you, you know how the Taliban looked down on the women, so. He made it a point to put the broadcast on the radio, you know, that, that a female was up in this plane, um, you know, kind of dealing death on you. But uh, I, I think it was the, uh, the uh, our media that, that took that and ran as the angel of death. So, okay. So that, that's how that all became, came about. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so while, when you deployed, you all took a piece of the World Trade Center with you? And then I think before you yeah, left, the, uh, you, you buried the, the it SF, there, right? Yeah, the SF team uh, did, and um, yeah, and and I knew uh, one of our guys had it in his rock and uh, carried it through, and then um, right in Masri Sharif, uh, we did a little ceremony there and uh, and, and buried it there. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, you know. Kind of, kind of moving, obviously. Yeah. You know, you know, innocent people losing their lives like that. Did your Did your family know where you were, or did they find out much later after you got there, or what was the situation back home? <laughs> well, I mean, they they knew we were, they knew we were going into Afghanistan. I mean, everybody knew that, right? When you de- when the, when we deployed, mm-hmm. you know, they uh, I probably went for. Oh, I don't know. Probably two months without talking. Month, month, month and a half. And then um, once once we set up the operations center um, in Masri Sharif, we uh, we had we had a really good internet connection down there. Actually, uh, to be honest with you, you know we had portable satellites set up, and uh, we were able to talk back and forth at that time. And then um, also uh, we could use the phones uh, and do uh, do a morale call every now and then, but. I usually just, uh, you know, you, you just have to type generically, but, you know, send emails, you know, all, all is good and, uh, and this and that, and just kind of had to watch your, uh, you know, your OPSEC yeah. at, at that time, your operational security. And, uh, but, uh, at that time, you know, we were, we were communicating freely, emailing every day, uh, at that point. Okay. Wow. I mean, 2001, I, I think the first time I ever used email, I know it was, it was 1998. So, I guess I just didn't realize. It's kind of hard for me to believe that there was such good internet over there in '01, late '01. Uh, yeah, they we we had some great com guys that set up some really good stuff. And uh, <laughs> excuse me, yeah, it was uh, it was really good actually. Uh, so before we move on to maybe to the to the monument, what is there anything else you'd like to share about about your deployment or anything or elaborate on anything we've been talking about? No, you know everybody. Uh, everybody says thank you, thank you. You know, and I, I can just tell you, it was uh, <laughs> there, there's no no thanks needs to be given. I mean, it was uh, that's that's what we trained for, and and uh, you know, it was. Uh, <clears throat> I, I was glad I was there at that time and able to go in and do what we did, and uh, you know, wouldn't wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I'd like to, the way that the way that the dominoes fell, you know, to that point, I, I would I would live it all over again the same way. So, did you feel that the uh, rules of engagement did they negatively fi- affect you or your team at that point <clears throat> when you were there? Um, to a certain point, 
Um, I, I, I probably won't get into them because uh, probably some of the stuff's still classified. But, um, but yeah, to a certain point, it did. And um, I wish we would have had um, uh, some A-10s and AC-130s in, in theater a little bit earlier. But um, I, I know um, that the perceived threat was the reason why they, they weren't in earlier when, you know, when we were moving. But um, the ROEs on, on using the fighters uh, inhibited us a little bit. But um, like I said, I won't, I won't get in any deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, yeah, that's interesting because I've obviously I, I, I'm, I don't know much about it, but I have, you know, I've felt that or I think the rules of engagement have gotten tighter and tighter. And, you know, I think they've, in my opinion, they've definitely hurt our guys. And, and I'm sure they're much tighter now than they were when you were there. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Other than, you know, our, our ROEs on the ground, um, yeah, it, it was pretty much the wild, wild west, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, working, but then when, when the aircraft came overhead, you know, they had their ROEs on, on what they could do and, and how they could do it, which, you know, kind of inhibited us a little bit, like I said, uh, it hindered a little bit. Uh, but we worked through it, and and that was all good, but yeah, the, the guys that are there today uh, pretty much have their hands tied, um, from what from what I understand, what I hear, and and, uh, and you know, and the talk around. Because you know, I, I still I still stay in the community a little bit, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's definitely not good. Um, so I mean, you know, we're we're we're. I, I just heard a general do a quote, and I, I won't do him justice because I, I don't remember how it goes. But you know, we're. We're, uh, we're we're good at uh, short wars and we're terrible at long wars and this is a long war and we're sitting over there and uh, and yeah the ROEs get placed on yeah and we're we're not good the, the military is not is not a nation builder and uh, that that's pretty much uh, what we're over there trying to do right now and and that's just not what the military was made to do you know the military is made to to destroy things and and, and win so that that's that's my opinion. Good point. Uh, I, I like that. Well said. So when you, uh, at some point later, uh, there is a, a an artist that uh, created a, a monument dedicated to the horse soldiers. And uh, now, though, first of all, there is a what I call an iconic image of you. It, well, several guys on your team, I guess, Bart. But I think you are kind of the kind of the focal point in the picture of you on a horse and. And um, and so there's a monument now in New York City that's that's dedicated to the horse soldiers or, or at least a uh, depiction to, re- to represent y'all. Do you, you mind telling us what that's about? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it was. As a matter of fact, uh, that's funny. Uh, ironically, I just got an email from uh, from that uh, retired sergeant major. Now the sergeant major is telling you that was in our team, saying that they're uh, they're doing the final dedication on. So they, they did a dedication on that, um, yeah, I think it was three years ago, four years ago, I went up there and um, uh, it was on Veterans Day. And um, they put it in a uh, in a temporary location and it was a caddy corner across the street from the uh, One World Trade Center now. And um, now it's going to its final place and I don't have the exact address uh, of it, but um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was made to, um, uh, it was all private donors that um that i guess had this made and and uh uh gentleman's name whose name eludes me now um the, the sculptor uh ended up uh uh getting it done in record time and uh and uh they had it up there uh for for that ceremony and we went up there and uh vice president biden spoke uh spoke at it at dedication and uh you know i guess they wanted to um you know, it's, it's it's kind of uh, interlaced with, you know, um, with the first responders out there in, in New York City, and uh, and it sits, um, you know, o- overlooking the uh, One World Trade Center. I, I do believe the final resting place is still going to be right in that area where it's where it's right by there. Uh, so you know, it, it's kind of an extension of uh, you know our follow-on. I, I think symbolic, if you will, our follow-on in the actions that we took after. Uh, you know, the attack on, on our soil. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so, you know, that, that really, you know, sums it up, if you will. Yeah. It's a, it's an impressive looking statue or monument, you know, whatever you call it. It's pretty tall. 
I don't remember. Yeah, it, it's big. No, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I, I want to see that. So I'll, if you know, whenever I get to New York again, which which my wife is dying for me to take her, that's one stop we have to make. I I think that's that. It seems like the artist maybe he he had a French name and he he, he created it in uh, Kentucky or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it was in Kentucky because uh, we went to uh, his studio there. He did a lot of work at another place and then brought it there to this to the studio to finish it. Okay. Well, do you ever do you ever look back and <laughs> and just think, man, you know that was that was crazy. It was crazy times, or you know, how did I get through it? Or anything oh, like that? absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. You look back and you're like, man, uh, you know, of all, all the all the technology, you know, even even in 01, we we had we had a lot of technology in in, in the soft field, and uh, and you know, and then next thing you know, you know, you're, you're jumping back, and uh, you know, in the Genghis Khan days, you know, and you're you're jumping on horseback. Of course, you got a, you know, you got a sixty thousand dollar radio on your back, you know, that that's your lifeline, you know, because that that's what we, you know, we use to, you know, communicate with, and uh, but yeah, it, no it. It's crazy. Well, every time I look back on that thing, it's crazy. Did you but ever have to engage the enemy with your gun while sitting on a horse? No, I never fired my weapon. Okay. <laughs> I didn't fire my weapon the whole, excuse me, the whole time I was there. Okay. Well, how did you adjust to life after deployment, and then, or maybe more specifically after retirement? I'm not sure, sure which was tougher, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, adjustment, uh, I, well, I, I knew it was time. Uh, well, I, I put, it, put it like this. I, I did it more, uh, I, I retired more on the family side of it. Um, I mean, I could have probably stayed at Hurlburt a couple more years. But, uh, you know, I was in E7, and uh, if I was going to stay in, uh, I definitely would, you know, would have stayed in to make, you know, E9 chief, uh, which is uh, obviously the highest rank in, in the Air Force, uh, enlisted. And, uh, but I, I always promised myself once my, uh, my two daughters, uh, got into high school that I, that I wouldn't move them, uh, you know, and, uh, they just happened to be in high school, you know, in, uh, in 2003, um, actually one was a sophomore and actually one was in eighth grade. She wasn't even in uh, high school yet. So, uh, so I said, well, I go, now it's probably, uh, as good as time as any, uh, I'm at my 20 year mark. I go, I'm not going to go any higher. Um, so I just decided to, uh, you know, to call it quits at that time after 20. And, uh, so it was actually 20 in a few months and, uh, and got out and, uh, yeah, the, the, the adjustment, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't difficult, uh, for me. Um, I, I missed the mission. I missed, I missed the guys. I don't miss a lot of the, the military, uh, I don't know, the military drill, if you will you know, the, the requirements uh, in the military, but I, I definitely miss my unit, <laughs> excuse me, and the personnel in the mission, so. <laughs> excuse me, dry throat. No problem. Yeah, I guess it's that brotherhood that you miss. <clears throat> no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So if you if you had to, or if you could do it over again, would you? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I had a, uh, I had a great career. I mean, even in, uh, you know, everybody jokes about, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, you know, as, uh, Vietnam, you know? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> terrible, terrible place to be stationed, you know? I was, uh, I was stationed there for eight and a half years, you know? And, uh, I, I had great time. You know, it was because of, the, you know, the team, you know, the people on the team and who you were with, you know? It, it was just a, uh, it was just a great time, you know? Did four years up in Alaska, great time. And, uh, you know, did my last seven and a half at Hurlburt, uh, down in, you know, Panhandle, Florida. Great time. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> absolutely do it all over again. Same way. No doubt about it. Cool. What, what advice would you give to guys now that are considering the CCT field? Oh, I, I would definitely, uh, in, encourage them, you know, uh, it, it's not an easy ride. And, uh, you know, if I could, uh, I quote one of my one of my buddies, a recent retiree, Bruce Dixon. You know, it's it's even after you're in, you got you got to prove yourself every day. I mean, uh, there's there's no 
there's no free ride. And, uh, and once you're in, I mean, you, you, you have to, uh, you stay, you have to stay on top of your game. I mean, that, that's the reason why, uh, why soft is so successful. Um, our, our soft units are so successful is because we, we continually train and train and train. And, uh, you know, when we were in Afghanistan and, and dropping bombs and ordnance, it was, it was just like we were on a, uh, a training mission here back in the States, you know, it was, you know, we were, you, we were doing everything with that we would do there and we were just doing it. It happened to be doing it on a, on a real battlefield. And, uh, and, you know, there's no substitute for, for training. And, uh, and that, that's why we were uh, so successful. You know, everybody was, was on top of their game and stayed on top of their game. And, and that's what you have to do uh, when you're in that career field. Now, yeah, well said. Well, I mean, in my opinion, you definitely are somebody who paved the way. And uh, I know there's a lot of guys before you, but I, I think it's just what you did was um, obviously so critical for the war on terror. And and uh, I've just really been looking forward to talking with you and to hearing you share some about it. Uh, you seem to kind of, uh, you know, be kind of a private person. That's my, my impression of you anyway. And, you know, just a quiet professional and so thanks for you know sharing a few a few circumstances with us today and a few feelings with us. And yeah, that, but yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, I, uh, I I try and stay humble. That's for sure. Well, yeah, yeah, you are. Is, is there anything in closing that you you'd like to say? Uh, least no. I see. That, that, I guess that's why I'm a quiet. No, I'm not. I'm, actually, if you're around me, uh, you know, <laughs> with a few beers, you, 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 I'm probably one of the loudest guys there. But uh, <laughs> not not spouting off by by any means. Uh, but uh, no, you know, I, I uh, like I said, um, I, I think I, I pretty much uh, capped everything, and uh, I, I enjoyed my my 20 years there, and uh, I would uh, I would do it all over again. So I think. Um, I think that that marks uh, success when you say you, you would do it all over again in, in the same way. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I guess I had a successful career. Well, you are exactly what this podcast is about. You are a patriot to the core, and I, I really thank you. And, and I know there is a book called Horse Soldiers that, that documents this particular deployment. Uh, is there any, any other, uh, any other uh, literature out there that you know, people could read to learn about it? Uh, I would just say uh, I think the first there uh, by Gary Sharon okay. um, is a uh, is a is a great book and uh, that's really uh, if you want to go in chronological order I would read uh, if anybody's interested in reading the books I would read that one first and it, and it sets up everything for what happened uh, uh, next it was really it, the, the title says it all I mean they they were in there first and. Uh, Got everything organized with the uh, the Northern Alliance and uh, the other warlords, if you will, at, at that time, uh, uh, shortly after 9/11. Great. Well, I'll put those in the show notes so people can. Uh, I'll have a link there where they can go. Um, you know, yeah, you yeah. Know. Look, look the book up and make sure I make sure I have that that correct. If, if you Google it, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, if I have if I have one of the words wrong or something in the book, it, it'll come up correct. Sure, I sure will. Well, thank you very much. I I really appreciate you, Bard. And I'll uh, I, I don't think we've met, uh, but I hope we do. Maybe at a at a, a, a reunion or or something. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. I, I'd, I'd love to shake your hand and uh, and my deep deepest sympathies uh, to you and your family uh, for uh, for your loss and and our loss and and, and our community um, cool. with, with your brother. But uh, you know, I I want to say something. You know, I, I looked. Um, you know, my, my wife read read that book first, and uh, and then uh, and then I downloaded it. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I just see your brother with that uh, with that Alabama hat on, and I, you know, he, he, he something just grabbed me. You know, I saw that picture first uh, when my wife was uh, reading the book, and I go, man, I go, I go, I go, there's a stud right there, you know. And then uh, so that kind of made me read the book, and uh, and sure enough, it, it, your brother was, and. Uh, and uh, everything that goes with it. So, so the the, the picture uh, just just reveals a lot of things. And uh, and, and that one with his kid on and that Alabama hat on uh, was uh, was definitely one that, that that caught my eye and uh, and piqued my interest for sure. 
Well, good. That's good to hear. I, you know, that was a, a source of a small debate of what image to use, and but no doubt that was the right one. So I'm glad to see to hear from somebody like you that it, it affected positively. I think I still think and I've said this before in another interview with my publisher that I think that cover is one reason why Costco will not put the book in their store. That's a, that's a personal opinion. They haven't said it, but I think that they think really? oh, it's too it's too strong. But you know, I'll always believe that unless they uh, well, I'll always believe it until they put the book in the store, <laughs> which which yeah, still yeah, I got you, I got you. <laughs> Well, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, my brother was a stud, but you are too, and and so I'm really grateful for your service and for your your uh, willingness to fight the enemy and to to do so much there in the early days in the war on terror. Well, I, I appreciate that, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll see you down uh, down in one of the reunions one day and uh, and shake your hand and uh, and talk with you. Great, sounds good.